Well, there are two reasons I'm delighted to have Jane Nelson with us this morning. Uh, the first has nothing to do with why I invited her. Uh, the second has everything to do, but I'll tell you the first one because I'm just glad to remember some things. Uh, I pastored a church in Irvine for 14 years. Uh, Pete and Jane Nelson were part of that church. Uh, the night my wife went into labor uh, with our third son was just before dinner at the Nelson's house. Now, uh, and you need to know that uh, Andy came uh, under an hour, so it was like from the moment it started to the moment he came in, we, we, were, we, were, well, anyway, we were at their house, I was starved, and I really wanted dinner. And uh, I remember hustling Loretta out to the car, and the last thing I did before I got out in the car to get down to the hospital was have one slurp of that great pumpkin soup you made, Jane. That was great. Anyway, it's good to have friends that can remember those stories. But the second reason, and this is why I have asked her to come, is uh, uh, it's two things that have really guided my life. The first one is uh, the old line, do uh, you know how to make God laugh? And the answer is, tell him your plans. Um, none of my plans have ever worked out. Uh, God always has something else in mind. And the second one is a quote from one of the uh, English Puritans of the 17th century. He said, we ask God for silver. And he says, no, I want to give you gold. And those two, uh, the plans we have and the plans that God has, his no, which always is for the sake of a greater yes. And uh, it's how Jane Nelson has come to understand these things is why I have her here in chapel this morning. She manages several special projects for nonprofit organizations working in Africa. Now, her uh, Vita says her primary focus is on the delivery of financial services to people living in poverty. Uh, some of us might know that as something called microfinance and things related to it. Now, Jane began her career in banking after receiving a BS in marketing from San Diego State University. Uh, she did a lot in the banking world, has held several management positions, product development, and so on. But currently, she serves on the boards of Leadership Network Telemachus uh, Opportunity International, and she's on the board of two banks in Africa. And uh, how she got there, where she started, is a great story. And I, I asked uh, Janie to come uh, about a year ago. Would you come and just speak in Westmont? And she has graciously done that. I, you know, and actually, I think this might be the largest group she's ever spoken to. Uh, but she now lives in uh, Newport Beach with her husband, Pete, my old buddy. And uh, they have two grown children. Uh, Jane, come on up. I want to pray for you. Let's welcome her to Westmont College. Yeah. Yeah. Father in heaven, thank you for this, uh, this sister, this friend, this co-worker in the gospel. Lord, uh, bless her and bless us as she uh, tells her story. And Lord, I pray we'll come out of this place encouraged to trust you and your plans for our lives more than anything else. Uh, give Jane courage, clarity, and I pray she'll have fun as she speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, and thank you for your warm welcome here this morning, and a special thanks to Ben for inviting me to be here together with you this morning. One of the most important things I ever learned in my life was from a theologian and a philosopher by the name of Howard Thurman. And he spoke these powerful words. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what it is that makes you come alive and then go out and do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. For many of you sitting here this morning, you may already know what it is that makes you come alive and you're ready to go out in the world and do it. And still for others, you may be in the process of figuring out what it is you are really passionate about. And still for others of you, you may be considering the gifts and the talents that God has given you and wondering if one day he might call you out in the world to use those for him. For most of my life, the idea of being called by God was something I never, ever wanted to happen. For me, it was something akin to the Poisonwood Bible. 
It was this picture of a very poor missionary couple who had a way too many kids who got sent to some scary part of the world, like the Congo, to impart a message to people who didn't speak their language and had no idea what they were talking about. And then there were the snakes. So as you've probably figured out by now, I decided early on that this just wasn't for me. As much as I greatly admired these people, I just was not one of them. And somewhere along the way, I concluded that God thought this as well, and thus I was probably off the hook. But I don't think God ever really lets us off the hook. I think he has a purpose and a plan for each one of us that he reveals to us in his own time. This morning I'm here to share with you a story, and it's not so much my story as it is God's story. And I know it's his story because it's a story I never ever would have written or ever could have written. It's the story of a God who works through people just like you and me to accomplish immeasurably more than all we could ever ask for or imagine. The story begins when I was your age and I was in college, and I thought I had my life all planned out. My idea of college was to study really hard, and I do mean that. Uh, it was to have fun, meet all kinds of different people, and somewhere along the way, figure out who I was or who it was I wanted to be. And then the most important thing of all was to meet a darling guy. So I went off to college, and I did do all those things, um, including the most important one of all. I met the darling guy. I met the man of my dreams, we fell in love, and we were married shortly out of college. And he's here with me this morning, my husband Peter. <laughs> so we moved into our first little apartment, and we both had great jobs with major corporations. And our idea was that I'd work a few years, we'd save a whole lot of money, and then we'd start a family. So two years into our marriage, we decided to do just that. But having children was not as easy as we thought. And a year went by, and two years, and three years. We sought help from the medical experts. We pursued adoption, but were told it was a five-year wait. And we were now into year six of our marriage, and I was really, really angry with the Lord for not giving us children. At the time, my favorite magazine was Fortune magazine, and it was all about these Fortune 500 companies. And mostly I liked reading the articles about the women, these women that were breaking through the glass ceilings and becoming these corporate executives, and every once in a while there'd be a picture of one of them next to the corporate jet. And yes, this was the excess of the 80s, but to me at the time, I thought it all looked really impressive. But as I read these articles and looked at these pictures, I could always hear myself saying, that is never going to be you, Jane, because you're going to be a mother at home with your children. But somewhere along the way, I realized that things had changed and that perhaps it was time for me to change as well, to let go of some of the hopes and dreams that I had for my life and to seek some new ones. And I would like to be able to stand here this morning and tell you that I had the true belief and conviction that God knew what was best for me in my life and that all I really had to do was to seek him out and he would give me a new sense of direction and a new vision for my life. But I didn't do that. I decided on my own, out of my anger at the Lord, that I was just going to go out and put everything I had into my career. I was going to break through those glass ceilings. And so I took a job with a major bank in the corporate marketing department in California. It was a time of deregulation of the banking industry. Things were fast-paced with constant change. I worked with this amazing group of 30-somethings who absolutely know, knew no limits. We were transforming what we thought was this stodgy old bank into a market-driven organization 
with endless new products and marketing strategies. And I moved from one extraordinary job to the next. It was an incredible ride. But by the time I reached 37 years old, I could feel the wear and tear. Things weren't as, as exciting as they once had been. I, I had done more than I'd ever dreamed of. And for Peter and I, our life and our marriage was nothing of what we had ever hoped it would be. And then one day, it all changed. I was in a meeting, and my secretary came in and told me that Peter was on the phone, and it was important. And Peter had never given up on adoption. And the phone call started something like, you're not going to believe what I am about to tell you. And our social worker had called and told Peter that a little baby girl had just been born, and we were being asked to be the parents. He told me everything he knew, and then he hung up the phone. And I can so clearly remember standing there, looking out the window of my office on the 44th floor of this high-rise in downtown Los Angeles, and thinking to myself, I have worked so hard to get to where I am at, and now God is giving me something I never ever thought I would have, and I had a choice to make. I knew I couldn't keep the job I had with the long hours and the long commute and be the mother that I wanted to be, and so I made the choice. I decided to leave my career and start a new one. And I went home to this beautiful little baby girl that we named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was perfect in every way, including sleeping through the night. She and I did everything together 24-7, and she opened up a whole new world for me. And to Peter and I, she was our every delight and joy. A few years later, we adopted a little baby boy, Eric, and Eric brought with him a whole new level of energy we could barely keep up with. But with Eric, our family was complete, and it was immeasurably more than all we could have ever asked for or imagined. Before we knew it, they were in preschool and elementary school, our lives were filled with soccer and carpool and homework and family adventures. And then they were in junior high and high school. And it was about midway through high school that I realized when they went off to college, I was going to be out of a job. So I decided that I needed to figure out what I was going to do. And this began for me what was a year and a half of prayer and journaling, and asking the Lord to use me in some way to take all the blessings that he had given me in my life and let me go out into the world and use them for others. You are the first generation of truly global citizens, and you are more than aware of the limitless injustices there are in the world. And you are also probably equally aware of the endless opportunities that you have to go out into the world and right some of those wrongs and make a difference. And for me, as I considered and read and heard about the many injustices there were, there was one that I could not let go of, one that just kept coming back to me, one that angered me and compelled me at the same time and that was the AIDS crisis in Africa. But as much as it compelled me, I really had no idea what I could do. I had no medical background, no background in agriculture. I didn't know how to engineer well to bring clean water. For me, the reality of it was, I was a wife and a mother from Newport Beach, California, and what was I gonna do about an AIDS crisis in a place as far away? as Africa. But the turning point came for me one weekend when I was at church, and I heard about a new ministry the church was thinking about starting in Africa. And I attended the initial meeting. And in that meeting, they talked about microfinance. 
microfinance as a means of helping people to bring themselves up out of poverty by making them a small loan to start a business. And it was at that moment that I knew what I could do. I knew all about banking, I knew all about finance, I knew all about lending. But it was also in that moment that I heard the clear, resounding words of the Lord resonating in my head. Jane, you can hold a dying child in your arms, and you can pray them into heaven, and you can teach a woman how to start a small business. And it was in those moments that I knew the Lord had taken what was my career as a mother and my career in banking that I had never wanted and was so angry at him for. And he was putting them together, and he was calling me to Africa. It was also in that moment that I felt somewhat like Isaiah must have felt when he, is, he was so attuned to the voice of the Lord that when the Lord said in the midst of that crowd, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. Well, send me, the Lord did. It was three months later, a few days after the Iraq war had broken out, and I found myself headed to LAX to a flight to a place I never, ever thought I would go, to the Congo. Peter and I had gotten up at 3 a.m. We'd driven to the airport. We'd gotten my bags checked in. It came time for him to leave, and I just fell apart. I didn't want him to go. I didn't want to go. The reality of it all had set in. But at one point, he looked at me and said, Honey, I got to go. I have carpool this morning, and I don't want to be late. And with that, he turned, and he got in his car, and he drove away. And I turned, and I walked through the doors of that terminal to catch my flight. My week in Congo was and remains to this day the most extraordinary week of my life. Congo was a war-torn country. Five million people had died in the last 10 years. I landed at this airport filled with soldiers with AK-47s. Kinshasa was a city of 10 million people. The most part of it was just literally paved in trash. There was the poverty that I had expected, but what I had never, ever expected was the extent of it. It went for mile after mile after mile, millions upon millions upon millions of people. And then there were the dying. God's beautiful people, just ravaged by AIDS. They were but mere skeletons in their last moments of life surrounded by people that loved them and wept over them and prayed over them. And at night, it all went dark. This was a city in one of the wealthiest countries in all of Africa, with the Congo River that could power the entire continent of Africa with electricity. And they were living in the dark. But I met a people who were hardworking and smart and they so much wanted to turn their lives around, but they had nothing to start with. And I knew I wanted to help them. I returned to the United States, and a few months later, a civil war broke out in Congo, and it became too unsafe to return. But I was still determined to do something in Africa, and so I began to network and connect with other NGOs. And for the next five years, I traveled all over Africa, working on special projects for these organizations. I met some amazing people, saw the depth of the work that so many of these organizations are doing in the world. But in my heart of hearts, all I really wanted to do was to go back to Congo. And one day, I was sitting at my desk, going through my inbox, and an email popped up, totally unexpected. It was from an organization that was one of the major players in the world of microfinance and they were considering opening a bank in Congo, and they wanted to know if I would be a part of the team. And of course, I said yes. And I got on a plane, and I flew back to Congo. 
The team did the due diligence. We submitted a proposal. It was approved and it was funded. And in May of 2011, the first branch of the Opportunity International Bank of the Democratic Republic of Congo was opened. Today, we serve over 6,000 people living in poverty. The stories that I could share with you are endless of people who are transforming their lives, the lives of their families, and those in their communities. I'll end the story there. I did discover what it is that makes me come alive. I answered God's call, and today he has blessed me with the joy and the privilege of serving his people as they work to bring themselves up out of poverty. I'll leave you with these three thoughts this morning. First, today I know a God who endures with us through the difficult times in our life, even in our times of rebellion, to shape us into the people he created us to be, to do the work he calls us to do. Today, I know a God who sends me to Congo four times a year to do the work I love with a people that I admire and respect and whose faith is an inspiration to me every day of my life. And lastly, today I know a God who gave me two beautiful children I never thought I would have and a husband who supports me unbelievably in everything I do. That cute guy I met in college, well, he still gets up at 3 a.m. to drive me to LAX. He still holds me in his arms while I fall apart in tears. And he somehow manages to get my bags in my hands and get me through that doors of the terminal to catch my next flight. <coughs> and just one more thing. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what it is that makes you come alive, and then go out and do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. <laughs>